that Kingdom Talks is about information for transformation, where we provide biblical insight for our day-to-day -day living. So today we're going to hear for, from uh, a servant of God and also a man with multiple talents. And um, Dr. Denny, can you briefly introduce yourself to the audience? Wow. Well, uh, I'm a Jamaican that lives in London. Been here now for 50 years or so. Uh, married 38 years next month. Congrats. Two beautiful daughters. Wow. And six lovely grandchildren. But what I am is a Bible teacher. That's my calling. And uh, we can talk about my Bible school um, later in this conversation and the churches and all the different things I do. By background in terms of career, I'm a business and marketing specialist. And that's been my um, career for 30 years or so. So I know you talk about um, kingdom principles and using those things um, in the workplace and in life generally. And so that's rightly in tune with how I believe things should be for the believer. So I'm glad to be in your program today. Glad to meet you also. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before we proceed, I usually like to ask guests to share with us their salvation experience because everybody, how they came, give their life to Jesus is very unique. And I would love to hear how you came to, to believe in Jesus. Well, I grew up in Jamaica until I was eight years old. And I went to church with my grandmother, um, not willingly. <laughs> I didn't want to go. Uh, I wanted to be out in the fields playing football or cricket as it was then uh, with my uncles and the elder brothers and so on. But she kept me going to church. So um, from an early stage, I knew that God was real. I definitely was not an atheist. I knew that God was actually a living being. Mm. But the thing was that through my life until the age of 16, I never wanted to become a Christian. No Christian I saw, I would admire. I would never want to, my catchphrase in life was, I never want to live my life out of a book. Mm. And that book means in the Bible. So I wanted to do what I want, live how I wanted, go where I wanted, and basically being my own man. Nothing really just whatsoever. In fact, the idea of being a Christian was very, very awful to me. It sounded so bad. It was highly distasteful. And I nearly had a fight with somebody because he was telling me that I'm going to go to church one day, be a Christian like my brother. And I was telling him, no, no way under the sun. I'm not going to do this. But he was insistent, and I would. <laughs> I don't know what got into him that day, but he was very insistent. So I, I held him up, fist ready to punch him in his face. And I said, you better stop talking this stuff, or I, I'm going gonna, gonna to punch you. And uh, forward a little bit, that same person was at my baptism. Hmm. So how the Lord managed to save somebody like me who had no interest in God whatsoever was the fact that my elder brother was getting married. And in fact, he was getting married to the assistant pastor's daughter. And as it happens when people get married, the two families come together. So I went with my elder brother to the house of um, his future wife's parents. And they were all Christians. And I spent the entire day with them and looking at these people, thinking, I've never met people like this before. These people are strange. They, there was something about them. There was a, a peace, a serenity. I mean, they weren't doing anything in particular, but they just looked so joyful and happy. I mean, we'd watch a movie together, we had dinner together, and everything was nice, but it was just something about them. Their character was different. So, so at the end of it all, end of it all getting ready to go, ready home, to go home, now, home now, the mother who is the, the, assistant, pastor, is the assistant pastor, she said, oh, she would said, it be nice if a nice, you know, a nice young man young like you would like give the life to Jesus. life to Jesus? And I thought, oh, and no. Thought, oh, no. <laughs> this is ruining the day. Mm. Up until now, I was Up happy. Everything now, was, was good, happy, good food, good, 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 good conversations, conversations, watching TV. Watching TV. And now she's talking and Christian, now stuff. Talking Christian stuff. 
So I didn't want to so hear any of it. Any but I had to listen politely. To listen politely. And she's, you know, would you come church yeah, and so on? So she's inviting me. And I, I wouldn't say yes or no. If I said yes, I'd be lying. Because I know I wouldn't go in. I know I wouldn't go in. So on the way home with my brother, I was thinking about the day and how nice it was and so on. And I decided that as a thank you to her for open up her home the hospitality was so wonderful that she um she deserved me going and my presence would say thank you so the sun the next sunday came i went to church with my brother and no intention of going to church just physically being there and so i, I sat down church service was going on didn't mean much to me I was in my own world. Sundays was always my day for football with my friends in the park or cricket or riding my bike with my, my crew, as we call it then. And then suddenly I am in church on a Sunday. Well, that's all right. It's only a one-off. I'll be back playing football next Sunday. So I went through this service. I can't remember anything particular about it. But during the course of the week, I said, you know what? I think I'll go to church again. I didn't even know why, <laughs> but I went to church again. And then the following week, oh, I feel like going again. And I had no idea why I was feeling to go to church. But I wasn't going to church because I love God. I wasn't going because I wanted to seek his face, to worship, none of those things. Mm. I just felt like I, I should go. So I went. And over the course of several weeks, hearing the word of God, when the preacher is praying, and especially when he gave the altar call, I felt such a pull in my heart, a desire to go and surrender my life to Christ. But this is nothing I ever wanted, so I resisted. And the next Sunday I come, and another pulling, another pulling, and it just became stronger and stronger until I felt, okay, I will go to the altar and let them pray for me, but I'm a shy person. I can't go first because everybody is going to be looking at me. The spotlight is on me at the altar. So I wouldn't go. Someone has to go first. And so somebody did. And so it was only one person. And then two, three, four come. And so I had no more excuse. But I still fight against it. I held myself and said, you know, I mean, bodily, hold myself. No, I'm, I'm resisting. I don't want to go. <laughs> and then when the altar call was finished, it was like, uh, it was like a relief because that pull and that fight, that resistance had stopped. But the next Sunday, back in church, next altar call, it started again. And this resistance of in me saying, no, I don't want to go. And eventually, I just couldn't take it anymore. I said, Lord, I'm going. And I went to the altar and I knelt down and said, Lord, I give you my life. I will serve you. And from that day till now, and that was 1979, that's about March 79, hmm. till now, I've been following the Lord. Never gone back one day. I have no idea what it means to backslide. Hmm. I've just loved God all the, all the way. Wow. And he has kept me all this time. So that's, that's my journey. And the thing was, my life catchphrase, which was, I don't want to live my life out of a book. It so happened that the Lord's destiny for me was that I would live my life out of this book. And I would also teach this book. He's <laughs> called me to be a Bible teacher. So I'm actually teaching this book. question that I want to ask you regarding your call as a teacher sometimes we see the Bible as a religious book that is why most people do not consult the Bible when it comes to other essential areas of your life people think that the Bible cannot speak to their business for instance the Bible doesn't have enough information to speak to their career the Bible cannot speak to let's say raising their children 
But one thing I know, when you are a Bible teacher or a Bible student, you will discover that the Bible touches on all these essential aspects of our lives. Well, I, I presume we're talking about a Christian because the, the sinner, the man in the world won't be reading the Bible. Okay. But for, for Christians, um, I can't literally, I can't understand why somebody who's a follower of Christ, who calls himself a Christian, will not be studying God's word. For a start, it's not a suggestion. It's an instruction that we should study to show our, ourselves approved unto God. So Bible study and knowing what the Bible teaches, what God has to say about our lives, is crucial. Because how on earth am I supposed to live a way that pleases God and to know his will if I don't go in his word? So when you say the Bible is a religious book, yes, it's a religious book, but it's more than just religion. Or you, because the Bible has instructions, the Bible has an answer to every single area of our lives. You mentioned some of them. So in your career, in your business, in your family, you as a parent, you as a husband or a wife, as a neighbor to other people, as an employee at the workplace, as a business owner, employing staff, how you, how you live and interact with people at the gym, in the supermarket, on the street, in the train, in the bus, anywhere we go, whoever we meet, God's word governs every aspect of our life. In the smallest detail to the biggest aspect of life and that's what the word of god does there is no answer outside of the word of god mm. it's all within the god's word yeah so unless we study it and know what it says we will never know how to please god mm. we will never know how to live because the word of god is that which we have to abide by to please him and if we don't do that it's either ignorance because we don't study it or it's disobedience, meaning we know it, but we don't do it. Hmm. Yeah. That, that, as one prophet said, it is the word of God is more than my necessary food. Somebody said, thy, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Hmm. So for all of us who are believers, God's word has to shine the light at our feet to show us where to walk, mm. how to live, how to move, how to behave, how to act, how to think, mm. what our attitude should be. Because we grow up in a culture, whichever culture we grow up in, whatever country we come from, where the community values and the traditions and customs of that nation and our parents and you know, society in general and the media they will all influence our thinking. Hmm. So we have to have the Bible knowledge and principles so that we know God's thinking. Hmm. So we align our attitudes, our thoughts, the things we say and do hmm. based upon what God's word says. And we can never do, be able to do that unless hmm. we understand what the word says. And so for me, it's an instruction. It's not a piece of good advice that you must read the Bible. Mm. And in fact, it didn't say read the Bible. Paul, Paul says study, which means get your books, get your, note, get your notepad, get mm. your dictionary, get your concordance, mm. yeah, get your scriptures, and you go through it and you study, I mean, hour, two hours, three hours, love it. Don't just read a couple of verses and then run through the door to start your day. I mean, Bible study should be a time where you set aside to examine God's word because it edifies us. It, it allows us to know God better and how to live and please him. Hmm. And it's supposed to be such a part of us. It's to be like the very air that we breathe. And so it's crucial. And so every believer must study God's word. And one of the things about the generation in which we live now which the Bible calls the last days. Christ himself said that one of the characteristics of these last days 
is deception, false prophets, false teachers coming upon the earth, right? Deceiving men. How are we to guard against deception? This is the first thing he said. Hmm. Yeah, we know of wars and rumors of wars, distress of nations with perplexity. We know of famines and earthquakes. We know of all these different things. But the very first thing he said was, beware of false prophets. Hmm. And Paul said it. Peter said it. John hmm. said it. False teachers, false witnesses have gone out into the world. And hmm. they come as, as um, wolves in sheep's clothing. Hmm. But they come to deceive you, to corrupt hmm. you, to make you lose your way. So how can we guard against that? Hmm. How can we make sure that we don't be taken in and hoodwinked and deceived by these people? It's by hmm. knowing God's word. Wow. Because when they start talking and they say such and such, you can say, no, that's not hmm. what the Bible teaches. Hmm. You will recognize the false when hmm. you know the truth. Hmm. But if you don't know the truth because you don't study God's word, the man who comes in his shining slick suit and his nice tie, and he looks very, you know, charismatic. He speaks well. You think, oh, what a powerful man of God, able to quote scriptures, hmm. big church, lot of followers. He says certain things, and because he's got this big name and reputation, you say yes, amen, because you don't know any better. Hmm. We must be able to recognize when somebody speaks if it's in line with God's word. Hmm. Because if it's not in God's word, we don't say amen to it. We don't hmm. believe it. We don't drink it. We don't swallow it. We don't eat it. But we won't be able to be in that position if we don't know the truth of God's word. Because these people are very articulate. Yes. They can quote scripture more than me and you. And they will talk about all sorts of stuff and it sounds so convincing, hmm. but it may be error, biblical error. Hmm. And so the way not to be taken in by false teachers with their lies is to know what the Bible says. So hmm. that when you know the truth, you will always recognize error when it comes. Hmm. And that's what we have to be. And that's how we have to be as believers. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so much for elaborating on the importance of, of, of the Bible. Um, I wanted to ask you another question because I've heard this statement from a man of God. He made a point that sometimes something might be spiritual, but they're not biblical. Well, <laughs> just because it seems spiritual, it doesn't mean it's correct. Hmm. A lot of things that are spiritual are very incorrect are against mm. what the Bible teaches. Mm. Yeah. So because they're spiritual and jumping up and doing stuff and they think, oh, they're spiritual people. No. Is what they are doing in line with what the Bible teaches? Mm. If it's not, then that spirituality means nothing. See, Moses was on top of the mountain. He went to get the Ten Commandments from God. Yes. And the people were, were down below. And they're waiting for him to come. Mm. A week passed, they didn't see Moses. Mm. Two weeks passed, they don't see him. Then again, three weeks passed, they don't see him. What's happened to him? Mm. And so while they were there, they think, well, we need to do something. And they decided to take um, metals, mm. gold from the people, and they made it into a golden calf. Mm, 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 mm. And they had that from Egypt. Hmm. Because the, the Egyptians worship the cow. Yeah. yeah. And so they worship the, the bulls, to be precise. Hmm. It's part of their religion, part of their teaching. Hmm. And so Israel, having remembered but the bull worship, hmm. they decided to create bulls, make it as an image of a bull, shape hmm. it into a bull. And then they said, these are the gods that brought us out of Egypt. Hmm. 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 So they were being very spiritual. Mm. They were dancing and chanting and doing stuff and carrying on and having some sort of religious service, mm. celebrating these two man-made created bulls and said, these are the gods. Mm. No gods because they made it themselves. Mm. So they were being very, very spiritual. But was it correct? Mm. Did God accept it? Mm. No. When Moses came down, 
he was shocked at what they were doing. He, he threw down the, the Ten Commandments and broke the, because they would have been judged by it and punished by it. So just because people are doing something that you can call spiritual, it doesn't mean it's in line with God's word. If it is not in line with God's word, we can reject it. Yeah, there's a lot of things in the churches today, and it's not just in Africa, but there's a lot of churches today who've got all sorts of different customs and practices and hand-me-down teachings through the generation mm. that's mixed up with paganism or different different spiritualist stuff, yeah. the tribal stuff, bush doctor stuff, yeah. all sorts of things that people have brought in and mixed with proper Christianity. Mm. And because people grow up now, don't know the origins, mm, don't mm. know where it comes from, oh boy. they're reveling and think they're doing God a favor. Mm. They think they're doing right. So they might be spiritual with their activity mm. and then they're praising God and then they're singing of the song. Mm. But because that is not biblical, mm. God does not accept it. Wow. And because God doesn't accept it, we shouldn't accept it either. It's mm. got, everything we do has to have a biblical foundation. Interesting. Wow. Without knowing what the Bible teaches, you believe something else that somebody says because he speaks it very clearly, he's very articulate, he can communicate well, so he's teaching you this or preaching that, and you don't know any better. You don't know your Bible. And so you take it and you say, yes, amen. So you are actually in the wrong. Mm. You are against God and what the Bible teaches, but you don't know. You're ignorant. You're innocently doing this thing, thinking you're pleasing God when you're far from God in that thing. Mm. Yeah, it, it, the, 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 the common one today is Christmas, which has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Mm, mm. It's a pagan festival that existed hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Wow. Showing that it's nothing to do with him. Mm. But Christians today would fight and defend it, thinking that mm. this is about Jesus and his birth. Wow. And it's only because they're ignorant. They mm. don't know the origins of it, where it come from. Mm. And sometimes you tell them, or oh, they're exposed to the truth, but because they love the life so much, they grew up with it as a child, and they love Christmas so much, it's in their mm. veins, they can't do without it. Mm. And so they think, oh, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> you know, God, God understands. No, God understands his word. And he's given us his commandments. Mm. And he expects us to be obedient to them. That's yes. what Christ said. If you love me, keep my commandments. So don't tell me you love Jesus. And then don't keep his commandments. Mm. It doesn't work. Mm. You have to go God's way. And so because people are ignorant... They have this lack of knowledge. It, they just believe anything. Yeah. In the absence of the knowledge of the truth of God's word, in that vacuum, they believe anything that comes that, that's so incredible. Especially when it comes from certain, certain people in shiny suits who write books and you see them on TV and they have a big following and say, yeah, that must be a man of God. And all he has to do is to speak a few things that are true, quote a few scriptures, and say something about them that's true. And you get people saying, yes, amen, and you're really behind him. So now when he slips in something false, slips in error, you don't recognize it. Because to you already, the man is credible, believable. And you're, you're in the yes, amen mode. Yes, amen. And you keep saying yes, amen for the, for oh, the next God. 20 minutes. And then on the 21st minute, he slip it in the light. You don't see it. You don't recognize wow. it. You're just, you're just drinking everything the man's pouring out. Lack of knowledge will do that. Hmm. But in the, in the book of Acts, we heard about these Christians in Berea. Yeah. Doesn't matter who comes to town, the biggest preachers who come to town. They wouldn't just accept it. They would listen very carefully and respectfully, but then they would go and seek the scriptures for themselves to see whether or not those things that were preached was so. And if they go through the scriptures and find, yes, they're speaking in line with what the scriptures are, amen to it. 
we accept wow. it. But they wouldn't accept it until they search the scriptures first to see whether or not that preacher is in line with mm. what the Bible actually says and teaches. Wow. And that's what we should do. And we can't do that if we don't have the knowledge of his word. Mm. That's why it's back to the instruction. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Mm. A workman that doesn't have to be ashamed, mm. but he can rightly divide the word of truth. Meaning he can rightly interpret it hmm. and under the correct understanding of it because he's taking the time to study it. So how do we differentiate personal revelation from the written revelation that we have in the Bible? Well, if a man comes to me and he says, God has shown me this, God has told me that, that fine, great, wonderful. I, I listen to him. I listen to him. But I listen to him listen to with the mind of the scriptures, the of the scriptures. Mm. because mm. he cannot because say anything cannot that's say contrary to what, contrary the Bible teaches. To what the Bible teaches. Yes. He can't say God has he revealed something to him. He has a word of revelation, a word of revelation. but it's actually against what, what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches. It, can't be. it can't be. Because if it is, because I totally it reject is, it. I totally reject it. It, you, so, so if God has, so, so if, if God has told, if God has told um, through the mouth of prophet, um, the mouth if God has told God Daniel, told or, Daniel Jeremiah, or Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Ezekiel, um, Nahum, um, any, of Nahum, prophets, Nahum, any of these prophets, any of these prophets, any of the scriptures, any of the scriptures we read in the Bible, we read in the Bible. And, remember, and remember, all, all they, they are all, all God's, God's word. word. Yeah. yeah. These, these men of these holy men of God were moved to write the things that they wrote. Right? It was the spirit that gave them the, the words to, to say, to preach, or to write. Okay, so, so, so what we have in the Bible is God's word. Yes. Now, if the spirit gave them these words, which we have in the 66 books of the Bible, and it's the Holy Spirit who gave those words, then how can somebody else come along today and say, and say God has given me a fresh revelation, revelation. Mm. that contradicts what the Holy Spirit already said to us in his word. Mm. That doesn't make any sense. God mm. is not the author of confusion. Mm. So the prophet today who says something that totally contradicts what Daniel said, or Elijah, or Elijah, or Hosea, Ezekiel, any one of them, or what Paul said, or what John said, or what Peter said, or any of the authors, how can the same Holy Spirit reveal something to a preacher today that contradicts what the Holy Spirit already said in the Bible to a prophet or an apostle? As what happened? The Holy Spirit changed his mind? Was the Holy Spirit wrong mm. then when he spoke? When but he spoke, right now to today's right prophet? To today's prophet? No. Mm. no. This is this is this is no, silly this nonsense. Is, this is silly nonsense. If any man comes, any man I mean comes, Paul put it this way to be Paul blunt. This way, to be blunt. He said, even he said, if an angel even from even heaven angel come, down, from heaven come down, down, and he's mm. preaching wow. some he's other preaching doctrine, some, some doctrine, other message, some, some other teaching, some other teaching. Hmm. Than that which he than already has received, received from the Lord and is teaching as an apostle. Let hmm. him be a curse. Let that angel that come from heaven. Let him be a curse. So it doesn't hmm. matter who so it is. The biggest preacher. The biggest bishop or apostle. The most well-known one, well one in the world. If you come with something come other, other than what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches. You are false. You are false. You are mm. wrong. You are wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean doesn't that you, mean as, that a you minister, as a minister, is a false minister. Is a false minister. Because you may be, a true, may be a true minister, but the teaching but that you are now doing, you're now doing is, wrong. is wrong. You mm. don't know any better. You don't know any better. You are ignorant of it. You are ignorant of it. Mm. It's something that you were something taught, that you were in, taught seminary, in seminary, taught by your pastor, by your pastor who received it from his pastor, from before, his pastor before, and before his, and pastor, before his pastor, going back going generations, back and, generations, generations and, generations. and generations. What I call hand-me-down hand teaching. 
through the generations. <laughs> generation. And so you pick it so up now, it up now and, yes. you and you believe it and you run with it, run with it and, preach, and it, preach it, but you don't but know, you that, don't it is know wrong. that it is wrong. So you mm. may preach an error, preach an error but you, is, but you, you yourself are true. Yourself are true. Mm. So because so you are true, the Holy, true Spirit the Holy Spirit will bring, will bring the, the truth, truth, bring the yes. correct teaching. Correct teaching. To, mm. your to your understanding, yeah. so that you can so now know the now truth. Know the truth. Mm. Because within, within Christianity, Christianity, there's a lot there's of a lot lies and heresies and, heresies and false teachings. And, teachings. Mm. and based, on, based who on who we have been, we have been under, under and are being and schooled, and schooled by, by who's been our leaders and pastors, we adopted some of those teachings, and we didn't really question it. We accept it, because that's what is taught in our denomination. Hmm. But, what but what I tell, I tell people, people, never mind what the, mind what the denomination, denomination says, look at look the scriptures, look at the scriptures for, yourself. for yourself. Yeah. See what the Bible says. So when you're talking to somebody, you don't have to say, well, my pastor says so and so. No, you can say, the Bible says so and so. Mm. You're quoting the scripture. Quoting the scripture. You're, saying what the You're saying what the Bible says. Because mm. you know because the Bible, you know for, the yourself. Bible for yourself. If you can only, you say, can my only pastor say my pastor says, it means you don't know it for yourself. You, don't know it for yourself. you are quoting what he says. But what if he's mistaken? But what if he's mistaken? What if he's wrong? Mm. What if he's wrong? Mm. Then you're gonna believe it and believe it and teach it yourself, it and, it and, and so you yourself. also will be wrong. And so you also will be wrong. So we have mm. to examine the scriptures so for ourselves. The scriptures for ourselves. Yeah. And how you started about? It, you started I know it to be a difficult conversation. When you go to your pastor, when you go to or, your bishop pastor so -so, or bishop so and so, or bishop so and so, and you so. says, "I've been reading so. the Bible." I've been reading and what you have been teaching on this point, on this matter, point, on this matter, is not in line with what the Bible not teaches. In line with what the Bible teaches. That is a difficult conversation that to go and have. And I know have. people will shy away from having such a conversation. But you don't necessarily have to go and but challenge the pastor over this. Challenge the pastor over this. You just examine the teaching that comes from him or her. Yeah. And you look yeah. at it and evaluate it in the light of the scriptures. In the light of the scriptures. Because the only yeah. test is the only test, the only test the only is test whether or not this preacher is whether or not this preacher is preaching in line with what the Bible says. What the Bible says. They have to preach what the they Bible says. What the Bible says. They can't preach anything different. They can't preach anything different. They can't preach anything contrary to the scriptures. Contrary to the scriptures. Because if they do, then you can because safely do, reject it. Then you can safely reject it. Let God's word be true. Let God's word be true. And all men be liars. 